Thank you. We turn to item two, our question paper. And question one, I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr President. I beg leave to ask the Minister for the Treasury what the purpose is of the National Insurance Fund, when and by whom the last review was undertaken of the operation of this Social Security Act, including in respect to this fund, and what the terms of reference were for that review, and when the matter will next be reviewed. And Treasury Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The purpose of the Manx National Insurance Fund is to pay the benefits and pensions that are listed in section 163 of the Social Security Administration Act 1992 as applied to the Isle of Man and certain administrative costs in relation to the collection of national insurance and the payment of benefits. In addition, following Timpwood approval, the fund was used to support the Ireland during the pandemic, with the salary support scheme and MIRA benefit being paid from the fund. <coughs> the Administration Act also requires that the operation of the fund is reviewed every five years, and this work is carried out by the UK Government's Actuaries Department, and the report for the period up to March 2017 will be laid before this Honourable Court later this year. It is intended that the review of the fund up to March 2022 will also be completed this year. The last review into the operation of the Social Security Acts was carried out by CI65 in 2014, and a review of the national insurance regime was carried out by PwC last year. Both, the, both of the reviews were subject to a tender process, and I will circulate to all members the tender documents for each of these reviews, Mr President. Both reports were made public and were debated in this Honourable Court. As stated in the Ireland Plan, it is intended to complete the review of the national insurance regime undertaken by PwC last year by the time of next year's budget. Thank you, Mr President. <coughs> Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I think the uh, CI65 um, terms of reference were actually published back in 2013 and 14, and there was substantial public accounts committee interest at the time in, uh, in this question. Can the um, Treasury Minister advise whether it was just loose English that he used in his answer uh, to a written question earlier this month about the opportunity cost of the National Insurance Holiday Scheme for the National Insurance Fund, because the Minister seems to advise in that answer that the National Insurance Fund operates, quote, as a buffer for fluctuations in the economy, unquote. What did the Minister mean by that, or was it just a loose use of English? Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. In relation to the comment um, from the written answer that the Honourable Member has raised, in terms of the National Insurance Fund as a buffer, the National Insurance Fund is a fund that is used to actually pay out benefits, so it gives security around the future cost of benefits. Um, and obviously, one of the issues um, as the economy changes is government revenue may change, whereas the fund actually gives us certainty around where the benefit costs are coming from. Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Um, thank you, Mr President. So, just to, to summarise then, can the Treasury Minister confirm that what he's just said then is that the NI Fund is a buffer for future generations for Social Security and national insurance and isn't for balancing the economy in 2022 any more than it will be in 2023 or 2024? Minister to reply. Mr President, a bit lost at what the Honourable Member is getting at, um, but in relation to the National Insurance Fund, it is there for a variety of reasons, which I've just laid out in my initial answer. Um, in relation to the National Insurance Fund, it <coughs> provides certainty around um, the cost of benefits. It has been viewed for many, many years since the fund was very first established um, that it is there to ensure that there is continuity and that there is funds available to pay out benefits that otherwise would have to be paid from general revenue. Final supplementary, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr President. So, in the initial answer, the Treasury Minister said that the purpose of the National Insurance Fund was to assure benefits and payments under Section 163 of the 1992 Act and to pay administrative costs. That's not the same thing as um, supporting uh, the economy as a buffer for fluctuations in the economy. Can the, can, can the, can the Treasury Minister confirm that he, under, he agrees with uh, that point? The second point is, back in 2014, at the time of the CI65 review, um, long-standing, excellent members of the Treasury, uh, Mr Henderson, Mr Tier, supported by Mr Robertshaw, 
talked about the next generation, not the next general election. They were worried about the sustainability of the National Insurance Fund. They said that the evidence says our current system is broken and not fit for the future, and that they, were, they had to increase pension age to, to 66 and then to 67 because the fund was running out by, 19, by, by, sorry, by 2047. Does the Treasury Minister agree with me that the messages are getting a bit mixed because seven years ago we were told that the fund was running out and now we're told it can be used to hundreds of millions of pounds extent to support current fluctuations in the economy. Minister to, to reply. Mr. President, completely disagree with the Honourable Member. That's not what's being said at all. It's not being said that the National Insurance Fund can be used to support hundreds yes. of millions of pounds. This Honourable Court, if he's referring to the pandemic support schemes, um, took the view at the time that it was the right place for those, um, for those schemes to be funded from. The schemes supported um, people during what was a pretty unprecedented time, Mr President. In fact, you've got to go back 100 years to find something similar. It was the right decision then. I believe it's still the right decision now. Um, the National Insurance Fund is not a buffer in the way the Honourable Member is portraying it. It is there to ensure that we have sufficient funds to honour the commitments in relation to benefits that need to be paid, which, if we didn't have that fund, would have to come out of general revenue. Um, so that is the reason for the National Insurance Fund. It was the historic reason for it, and I think it's still relevant today. Move to question two. I call on the Honourable Member for Arby Castamalu, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Chief Minister how the nature of the People's Wood is evolving and if he will make a statement. Call on Chief Minister to reply. Mr President, as an action initiated and led by the previous Chief Minister, I am pleased to pick up the baton on this initiative and to be able to provide an update. The Department of Environment, Food and Agriculture continues to manage the site and, as planned, are currently replacing trees that have died and will continue to do so on an annual basis as required for the next four years to ensure a good establishment rate. Over the spring and summer months, the Department will be surveying for next year's replacements and undertaking regular weeding to keep the competing vegetation under control. The site has a central access path designed into the planting layout, which will be used by DEFA to support the ongoing maintenance and which will in time become the primary public footpath across the site, which will link it to the Radnifolian coastal path. DEFA's intention is that over the next few years, this site will be monitored to ensure successful tree establishment and any future works planned for the formulisation of the footpaths and the car park are appropriate both in terms of landscaping as well as the financial costs involved with the development. I look forward to seeing over the next few years the growth and development of the People's Wood. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Chief Minister. What, are, what has been the total budget for this initiative and what is the total spend so far? Have all the trees now been planted? Thank you. Chief Minister, to reply. Uh, Mr. President, Treasury provided £258,000 from the Contingency Fund for expenditure against the Department of Environment, Food and Agriculture's five-year tree planting strategy, and this was to include the People's Forest, amongst other things. I understand that £110,974 has been spent today on the People's Wood. Um, however, £30,000 of that money has been sponsored by Barclays Bank, leaving a total spend uh, from government of £81,974. And I understand that DEFA has planted over 80,000 trees on the site. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Chief Minister. Um, was that new money for DEFA, or was that a change in what was actually provided, being planned for? And in terms of the general maintenance, has a recent assessment been done in, to the survival rate? Concerns being raised about potentially not the level of survival that one might expect for an area of woodland. Thank you. Chief Minister to reply. So just in terms of uh, the, the um, survival rate, uh, I understand that uh, the current, what they call the beat-up rate, is about 40 per cent, but these trees um, will be uh, replaced. Uh, and the money for this was provided from the um, contingency fund uh, for, uh, as I said, the five-year tree planting um, strategy, and uh, uh, that was put forward in the um, budget as contingency funding. Final supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Chief Minister. Um, when will the woodland be promoted and people actively encouraged to visit the site? Thank you. Chief Minister to reply. Uh, well... Obviously, Mr President, the creation of any new wood takes uh, many years and, of course, the management and maintenance uh, never really ends. 
Um, over the early, early years, managing the establishment of the trees, replacing failures and controlling weed growth takes priority. And I think uh, I would suggest that once we have got uh, firm take up and establishment and some substantial uh, growth in the trees, then I think the wood will then begin uh, to be promoted and used more actively by the general population. Move to question three, and I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castletown Maloo, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure how many emergency road closures there have been in each of the last three years because of tree falls. Thank you. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I can confirm the number of emergency road closures recorded by highway services for fallen trees are as follows. In 2019-20, there were 12 emergency closures. In 2021, there were 24, and in 2022, to date, there have been five emergency closures. The above figures exclude closures instigated by the Emergency Services Joint Control Room, as the Department does not hold that information. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. How do these figures compare with the long-term average, and are the figures within the expected range, especially last year when there were 24? Thank you. Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. With regards to them being in the average, uh, I would suggest looking at this year compared to the last two years, I would say it looks as though it's going to be, but it's purely dependent, I would suggest, on the weather. Uh, and we have no control over that, so we'll just have to wait and see at the end of the year. With regards to year, compared to years before that, I don't have those figures. And uh, if the Honourable Member wants to uh, take it up with me later, I'll certainly have that conversation with him. And apologies, I missed the last part of your question. Supplementary, if you wish to add that, Thank Mr. Mr. Morehouse. President. Yeah, just in terms of is it within the expected range, that 24, because it looks rather a high figure. And also in terms of the closures, do you have any information in terms of them being caused by trees that were known to be diseased? Thank you. Minister to reply. With regards to being within that, uh, that number, if you like, I don't have those <coughs> figures, but I say I will get those from him. And as regards to those that are diseased or not, I'm sure at the time they don't uh, look at that when they're busy cutting them down in the middle of the night. But uh, I'm not sure whether death or uh, we hold those uh, figures at all. I'll have a look again, Mr. President. Final supplementary, Mr. Mohouse. Thank you, Mr. President. What support is available to ensure that trees that need removing are removed as quickly as possible to reduce the risk of accidents and road closures, but also to enable new saplings to be planted? Thank you. Minister to reply. Yes, Mr. President. There's an ongoing programme between my department and DEFA. We're working together. Uh, surveys have been done of all the diseased trees on the roadside, and it's into the long thousands. Um, and we are working together to um, sort that problem out. But it, obviously, it will take an awful long time. And of course, a lot of those trees aren't owned by the department or by government; they're owned by privateers. So we're having to work with those as well. Move to uh, question four. Call on the honourable member for Russian, Dr. Hayward. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to ask the Minister of Infrastructure what the waiting time is for imported vehicles to be inspected for roadworthiness. Minister for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. President. The normal waiting time for an imported vehicle to be inspected for roadworthiness is usually about two weeks. However, there is currently a delay of approximately six weeks. This delay is due in part to the time required for the examiners to close down the operation at the vehicle testing centre in readiness for their re relocation to the new one with this resulting in fewer tests taking place during this time. Furthermore, waiting times have never previously returned to pre-COVID levels due to the annual leave and COVID staffing issues and also the retirement of a vehicle examiner. Relocation of the new site took place during this last weekend. There will be two days of commissioning, which has been yesterday and today, to allow the staff to settle in and familiarise themselves with the new equipment at the new vehicle testing centre, which will open tomorrow for business again as usual. TT will also have an impact on testing capabilities as the vehicle test centre is not easily accessible during waste periods and most people do not want to have a test appointment at the time during this uh, TT period. The examiners assist the police in road traffic collisions and whilst it is hoped these are minimal, there have been occasions where resources, required to be, resources are required to be diverted to inspect vehicles involved with RT, uh, RTCs and defect vehicles apprehended by officers. Bookings for appointments during race week are kept to a minimum for those reasons. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Callister. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Minister for his statement this morning. Could I ask the Minister, if possible, to look at his time frame of six weeks? Because I've had several um, car sale outlets saying that they're waiting up to three months to get vehicles through the test centre. Minister to reply. 
Yes, Mr. President, I'm happy to tell the honourable member I have already looked at that because I've heard comments from uh, the private people, the people out there wanting to do their own private cars that uh, garages seem to get priority, and I'm told that's not the case. Uh, but I will happily look into that again and speak to the honourable member about it afterwards. Supplementary, Dr. Hayward. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his answer. One of my constituents bought a vehicle across the island in February and rang the test centre. They wouldn't even give him a date and instructed him to bring it back at the start of April. So I suspect that the numbers that he's given today may not reflect the accurate waiting times. I think the other thing that's happening is that businesses are importing vehicles and they pre-book appointments whether they're needed or not. And so that is a disadvantage to private individuals. Does the Minister think this level of service is acceptable? And if it's difficult to meet an acceptable level of services, what changes might he suggest? Minister to reply. Um, I appreciate the Honourable Member's comments, and I don't think it is acceptable. I believe the staff are doing their best um, trying to backfill for, as a result of COVID and staff shortages up there and having to do other jobs outside, working with the police and other enforcement agencies. Um, I will talk to the mem member outside here again, but uh, the staff, I say, they are short up at the Vehicle Testing Centre. I'm due up there again at the end of this week and see if we can get any, uh, move, make, it any, uh, make it any better up there, if you like. Um, but I, I would say at the moment it's not acceptable, but it is what it is at the moment, unfortunately. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Given the current challenges, the shortage of staff and all the things that the Minister has mentioned, could private companies be used to actually allow a catch-up to occur? And is the facility capable of dealing with more vehicles? Thank you. Minister to reply. The, uh, the new facility, Mr President, will be capable of doing more facilities, but of course that depends on manpower and people being able to do the job, of course. Um, as regards to uh, going out to private, I think you said putting out to private garages, that's not possible at the moment. Uh, those garages would need to be licensed or whatever. Um, and the idea was the new test centre was there for government, if you like, to do this, but it's not something in the future that's been talked about before, about whether it be MOTs or just doing vehicle checks about private garages doing that. And there's no reason why that shouldn't be looked at in the future, Mr President. Supplementary, Dr Hayward. Uh, thank you. I wonder if the Minister would consider what the roadworthiness test is trying to achieve and whether it might be sensible to accept a recent UK MOT certificate for vehicles that are over three years old and that are imported, and that would help address the backlog that we currently have. Minister to reply. Again, Mr President, uh, I'm not sure how long it is since that was looked at, but there have been times when vehicles coming in have been found to have faults, even though they are fairly new. And we all know that once a vehicle is registered here, that basically, unless it becomes uh, a private hire or um, something along those lines, then basically those vehicles are out there on the road, and it's up to the, uh, the owners to see that they stay roadworthy, as we don't have the MOT here. So I think it is a good thing they are tested when they get over here. But um, it's, again, it's something that's been talked about for a long time, MOTs, and uh, I dare say it will raise its head again shortly. I mentioned Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. In the last answer the Minister gave to me, you made reference to four MOTs. Is the Department of Kit bringing MOTs into the island a standard? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Sorry, I think I got the Honourable Member right, and he said, are we looking at bringing MOTs in a standard? And that's not the case at the moment, definitely not. Final supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. President. I was going to pick up uh, on that same off-the-cuff remark um, about MOTs, but can the um, Minister confirm that policy is now about to change, possibly. We've just spent millions of pounds on a new vehicle licensing centre up at the, uh, up at, uh, up in, uh, just outside Douglas, but now we're considering allowing private garages to do roadworthiness tests. Is that what the Minister said? We're considering that. Minister to reply. I didn't say it was being considered. I said it could be considered, and I'm always happy to consider that, you know, as if it's an option for government saving money. <clears throat> <clears throat> Move to question five, and I call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. Um, in the interest of clarity, could I just confirm here for men of members that I am still the uh, chair of the small charity, the Douglas Bay Tramway Heritage Trust, um, although uh, charity fundraising is a bit in abeyance at the minute. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister for infrastructure when the horse tramway will be completed, when trams will operate, and if he will make a statement. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you, Mr President. <clears throat> there has been considerable difficulty in securing materials to finish off the horse tramway in the vicinity of Broadway, which is, criti which is, the critical, which is critical to the tramway operating. I am very disappointed that there is not a de definite delivery date on the outstanding components, so I am not yet able to provide a date for completion. Attempts are still being made to see if an alternative solution can be found that will allow the horse trams to operate this summer. The Department will make an announcement 
regarding the horse trams as soon as possible. Uh, and I believe that will be by the end of this week, Mr. President. Now, supplementary order. Oh, and <laughs> um, the, uh, the the horse tramway seems to have lurched from. Uh, one crisis to the next, um, from the red tarmac to the points um, to the, the delivery and the funding. Uh, can the, um, the Minister give us some sort of indication as to whether this project has um, been professionally managed or not, in his opinion, and what lessons he's learning from it? Minister to reply. I would have to say it has been professionally been managed because it's been managed by professionals. Um, Interesting <laughs> definition. <laughs> Whether it, has been, whether it has been well professionally managed is a different question uh, and one that will be uh, answered later on. There have been a lot of issues with this. It's, obviously, it started well before my time in the department, and this is one of the reasons why, and it didn't take long to see once I got into this department, there were going to be issues here, and it was not going to be finished as and when it was said it was going to be finished. It still isn't finished as far as I'm concerned because these lines, these tracks aren't done, and hopefully by the end of this week we'll have an answer on that. I am not hopeful. I will tell you that now for nothing. I am not hopeful there will be horse trams running this year from what I have just received this morning. But it is not a definite at the moment, but I am not hopeful at the moment. Um, I need some really positive and, uh, teamwork coming together from my department, and I will say that here and now to make this happen. Um, I think the Honourable Mr Speaker had another question there, which I have. No? Okay. Thank you, Mr President. Yep. Supplementary, Mrs King. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Minister mentioned that certain components were needed. Can he confirm if that is the points or if there are additional materials that are required? And could he also say, uh, in terms of it operating at all this summer, can he confirm it was actually um, trams operating yesterday for a TV programme? Um, and if you can manage to operate between the stables and Strathallan for a TV company, would it be possible on high days and holidays and for the benefit of the particularly the transport heritage uh, group visits that are booked for this year, would it be possible to have even a novelty ride for the benefit of those visitors who are wanting to come to our island? Thank you, Mr President. It's a fair clock. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Yes, it is absolutely the points that are holding us up. Uh, they were due originally from Germany. They were ordered in January. We were told they would be here sometime in March. There was an issue then at the factory and that was put back to June. We are now seeking to either uh, sort that issue here on the island, which I'm hoping is the information I'm waiting to get either today or tomorrow, or somewhere very close in the UK. Um, with regards to the tram that was out yesterday, it was there, brought out for a television programme uh, that was being made, uh, and it was purely on a straight piece of track. Um, to use the tracks that we have had put down, if the points were to be done, um, Obviously, there's some training to be done on the horses because there's bendy bits in the track now, which they didn't have to put up with before, and crossings, if you like. Um, and I'm told that to go up the tram line and come back against the traffic, if you like, is a dangerous procedure, and they, they would not be happy to do that. Although they did it yesterday in a very short section. Horses need to be trained to go around <laughs> corners. <laughs> yeah. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. After months of nothing being done at the bottom of Broadway, there are lots and lots of people there this morning, well into the double figures. Is that been a response to Mrs Kane's question, or was that work planned? Thank you. Minister to reply. <coughs> that is planned work on the, uh, on the <coughs> if you like, that has been, the signage has been up for a few days, warning people, and they've started that this morning. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. Um, can the Minister give us some indication of um, the, the completion of the reinstallation of the tram tracks? If and when the points and the other components are um, <coughs> arrive on the island and the tracks are completed to Broadway, would it be a simple task then to extend to the War Memorial and onto the end of Loch Promenade? And he mentioned that it requires teamwork and the coming together of all his department. Is he confident that his department is operating as a team and that they are all coming together to deliver this project? Minister to reply. I'll take the last bit first, Mr President. Um, it's not just my department, obviously. There's contractors involved in this. Um, and it seems to be, and we're all, we've all seen what's gone on over the last three years, if you like, that, that there has been issues. And there, certainly from the department's point of view, uh, it hasn't been teamwork all the way. Uh, and that has led to some of the issues there, I believe, which will come out later on. I'm sure. Um, I've forgotten what the, sections, the sections. Oh, with regards to the sections, if we get the points this week, as hopefully promised, if we get those, 
this, for this season, we'll just see that bit to, to the bottom of Broadway. My problem is with going on to the War Memorial is I need to know before that because I would rather do one job, and that would be only if Timwald says there's more money to take it from the War Memorial to the sea terminal I've had the money. Uh, in a future years, then I would do that whole job from where we are now to the sea terminal rather than going from where we are now to the War Memorial and then at a later date doing another job from the War Memorial to the sea terminal. So I need to know from Timwald if there's financial support to finish off from the War Memorial to the sea terminal before I commit to any major works after what, finishing off what we're doing at the moment. Supplementary, Mr Moorhouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Minister has been toying with us over that very issue for months and months now. When will the Department bring the required papers to Tinwald so we can actually make the decision on whether that can go ahead? Because at the moment, suggesting it could, it's down to us. We need that clarity. When can it come to Tinwald and when can we make the decision? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you. Um, the idea of that, Mr. President, is you know, when I come back, and it will be probably in June when the job is hopefully finished and we've got all and I have to come back for an overspend on the job, then hopefully then I will be looking to Timwald for their support then just verbally as to whether they would support me going to Treasury next year to ask for more money to finish that job from the War Memorial to not to the C terminal. If Timwald doesn't support me then I won't bother you know taking that to the depart to Treasury in later on when we go back for budget talks. Supplementary Mrs Kane. Thank you Mr President. Um, could the Minister um, recap for us what additional expenditure is remaining to spend to complete the promenade and the reinstallation of the tramways. I think previously he has said £1.2 million to the War Memorial and an additional £1.5 million to the end or in that region. But would he accept that Timwald has previously voted three times, I believe, in support of the horse trams, latterly in 2017, to instruct the department to complete the single tram line between the War Memorial and the End of Lock Promenade. So doesn't he feel that his department should carry out the will of Timwald and complete the tram line? And when he talks about the overspend and the additional funding needed for the tram lines, would he accept that that's because of the overspend on the roadway yeah, yeah. and the tram lines have not had the expenditure that, that was initially in the project for them. So why is the department's incompetence now being the responsibility of the tram lines and the tram lines at risk because of the department's incompetence? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I would nearly agree with everything that the honourable member has just said, except for the incompetence part, because it's not just the department here. There's other people involved <laughs> at all. <laughs> Some members find it funny. I don't when we're talking a lot of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money here, but I certainly don't find this funny at all. I find it really hard to deal with within the department, but the Honourable Member is basically right in what she said uh, with regards to the figures of what will be needed to come back. And yes, uh, when I come back to Timwood, as I said, probably in June for the overspend on the job, on the project, for the, you know, there will be a breakdown of where all the money has gone because I know money has been taken from the tram lines to finish the tram lines to put back into the prom and people need to know exactly where that's gone. And there are other parts that were, had money taken from them too, as far as I'm led to believe, to go into the prom to finish it, so other things haven't been done. And I will absolutely make that clear to honourable members of Timwood. Supplementary, Lorda. Uh, Mrs Kane. Thank you. Final supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. Um, one final point. Would the Minister accept that should the decision of Timwood, of this Honourable Court, be to scrap the horse trams or to conclude the line sooner? The point at which we should have taken that decision is before the Department invested £600,000, I think, in the region of that to purchase the stables, plus additional work on that and £1.2 million rebuilding the tram sheds. And if the Department has um, spent around £2 million investing in the horse trams as a visitor attraction, shouldn't they just get on and finish the job and enable them to operate and become a visitor attraction for the next decades? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. As the Honourable Member said herself just now, there is £1.2 million in the budget to finish the tram tracks up to the War Memorial. So the suspense that's been done on the stables and others beforehand will have been money well spent because those properties were not fit for purpose, if you like. The point will be whether the, 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 the tram lines goes from the War Memorial up to the sea terminal, uh, and that will be obviously a terminal decision at some stage. Thank you. Question six. I call on the Honourable Lorder. Good morning, 
Uh, I just asked the Minister for the Cabinet Office how many financial settlements were reached with and without non-disclosure agreements in the last three years, what the total value of those financial settlements was, and what plans she has to improve transparency in this area. Minister for the Cabinet Office to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The number of financial settlements reached with and without non-disclosure agreements, often referred to as confidentiality clauses, for the previous three years is as follows. For 2019-2020, with a non-disclosure agreement 31 and without 22 with a total value of 2,594,236 for 2020-21 for with a non-disclosure agreement 50 and without 13 with a total value of 1,635,019 and for 2021 2022 with a non-disclosure agreement 20 and without 2 with a total value of 893,817. To provide some context to the figures, the majority relate to contractual payments, including cases under mutually agreed resignation schemes, renegotiation of terms, voluntary and compulsory redundancies, and the settlement of a few employment <coughs> disputes. Mr. President, every financial settlement should be carefully considered before agreements are entered into to ensure the cost is given consideration and there may indeed be occasions where it may be more cost efficient to settle through an agreement. Mr President, upon inquiring to these figures from the past few years, I believe it is appropriate both for a clearer policy frame of reference and for greater oversight on this matter of settlement agreements, including financial settlements, by the PSC, along with reporting to Tynwald, and I give my commitment today for this to be examined and done. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary Lauder. Uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, the, the Minister's comments um, and that she will uh, facilitate reporting on these, these numbers annually uh, to Tindall going forward, which is welcome. The fact, that, however, that we have spent £5 million in the last three years on um, these sorts of settlements, um, does the Minister believe that the way that they are currently done without um, publishing where the money has gone and to whom and why um, is, means that it is easier, perhaps too easy, for departments to just pay people to go away. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'm um, not um, familiar with all the detail of all the individual cases, but uh, you know, I think just from that basic information, you know, yes, there needs to be fuller transparency. There should be a policy frame of reference. There is the involvement of um, MERS as a facilitator. <coughs> However, the honourable. Uh, you know, speaker is correct that there, that, that, that there is the role of departments in this and the role of um, OHR um, and that is why I think that in terms of um, the PSC having oversight and reporting in the annual report to Tim Wald on that, on that particular matter to ensure greater tran transparency, that should help both um, get clarity over that but also to understand you know, what perhaps the, the key issues are if we're looking at you know, how many people this involves and the grade of the reasons, the financial costs, and, and, and also the justifications over um, arguments for longer term savings where there has been um, an agreement for financial settlement. Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> to supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. What is the timetable for this review? Um, the current system makes it too easy seems to pay people off <coughs> without adequate consideration of the impact on public finances. And at the end of the day, the public's money is being used for this, and do the associated gagging orders simply mean that issues that should be resolved and considered in more detail are discussed because they can't be discussed openly? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, just to, to um, deal with the, the second point, first of all, from the Honourable Member. Um, the, um, the use of non-disclosure agreements are they, clauses. Sorry, they are used when it's, it's considered um, necessary to do so, and um, there is the advice on MERS as that uh, in terms of that, which acts as the facilitator. Um, um, I, I'm not committing to a review. I'm saying that actually the PSC needs to start receiving information on this in terms of oversight, and um, that the PSC report will um, report on, on the, the figures related to such financial settlements. So I, I think that, that's, what, that's what needs to, to happen on that. Um, Non-disclosure agreements and clauses are used in different circumstances that would relate to individual cases, so I would just make, make that point as well. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Lauder. 
Thank you. Um, would the Minister be willing to, to publish and review the policy as to when and why non-disclosure agreements are used? Um, and could I ask, does the Public Services Commission review these on a case-by-case on -case basis to ensure that they are learning the lessons that are coming out of um, employment tribunals and uh, other um, reasons for people leaving with significant amounts of taxpayers' money uh, to make sure that policies and practices are improved, not just um, within OHR, but around government. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it's it's um, precisely for those reasons that the Honourable Speaker has mentioned that I think that there needs to be a change in this regard, and hence the, the answer given in my um, original answer about there needing to be um, a clearer policy frame of reference and greater oversight. Um, from what I can tell, in my you know, an, you know, initial, initial role in all of this and looking into this matter. I don't think that sort of thing has, has uh, happened yet as a matter of course. I'm interested that it should, and I think that, that will, will help us clean you know, what, what the issues are, are and just give some more oversight and transparency over the matter that seems appropriate. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the Minister confirm that what she's announced is a uh, is a review of the transparency in respect of the non-disclosure agreements and the disclosure agreements, not a review of the policy in respect of uh, agreements and, uh, and arrangements and, and inside the various schemes that operate, because I think they're quite public in, on the Human Resource uh, web page. And secondly, can the uh, Minister agree with me that uh, it's not clear that the Public Services Commission wasn't aware of um, the major um, aspects and dimensions of this because it's my recollection that the Public Services Commission when it transformed itself did actually begin to receive quarterly reports which included um, this sort of um, information. And finally, can the Minister confirm that the Public Services Commission itself isn't actually responsible for all public servants? A great number of those have employing bodies which are not the Public Services Commission. For instance, bus drivers in Department of Infrastructure, teachers and the like. So can the um, Minister confirm it would be quite difficult for the Public Services Commission to get into those uh, um, peripheral extra special bodies that have chosen not to engage with the Public Services Commission fully. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yes, it's right that the PSC does not have responsibility for all of the different you know, public service workers. That is correct. However, my view is that the PSC should have an oversight role in terms of OHR. OHR is often involved in some of these matters. So that's the, that's the, the, the emphasis that I think is relevant. And I think that there could just be you know, a different way of this information coming forward to, to PSC for oversight. For clarity, Mr. President, I have not committed to any review. What I have said is that I believe there needs to be a clearer policy frame of reference for this matter to do with settlements and financial settlements and further I've given the commitment that in the interest of transparency I think that, that information, <coughs> such information should be reported to the PSC and then the um, annual PSC report should be put that, that's put to Timwald should include um, information as, as to those figures so that, that's been, those have been my commitments today. Thank you. Oh, and the final point is to do with um, non-disclosure agreements. I'm not reviewing any matters to do with that. You know, I appreciate that there is elements of, of the policy that is you know, available on that point. So just to be clear on you know, what I've committed to, there's those two points. Thank you, Mr President. And we move on to question seven. I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas East, Ms Farragher. Well, my doctor, um, um, I'd like to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture how emotional wellbeing is taught and measured in schools. I call on the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The emotional well-being of children and young people is a strategic priority for the Department. Staff in schools are closely attuned to the emotional well-being of the students they teach, and departmental officers work closely with schools to develop programmes designed to enable children and young people to manage their emotional well-being. In terms of how emotional well-being is taught, it is important to recognise the importance of a positive, nurturing ethos and culture in schools which maximises the impact of taught elements of the curriculum. Alongside schools' commitment to building a compassionate culture, there are several programmes available at a universal level for schools to teach. Even when required, desk officers train and support staff in the delivery of these. In addition, Manx Sport and Recreation support primary and secondary schools, delivery of sport and physical activity, some are designed to enhance emotional well-being and the youth service provide support via trained listeners as part of the secondary school's listening service. 
The Department is working closely with other agencies to strengthen the universal offer for emotional health and well-being in schools, whilst building appropriate pathways for additional or complex support. This includes educational child psychology support as appropriate both in primary and secondary schools and at the UCM. Whilst the Department does not seek to directly measure levels of emotional well-being of pupils across all education settings, individual schools monitor pupil well-being in several ways. Firstly, schools' pastoral support allows pupils to talk and to an adult whenever they need to. All pupils, therefore, have access to adults they can trust and feel safe to share their thoughts and feelings with. As a result, the school pastoral leaders regularly work together to address individual, group or whole school issues when they arise. Secondly, working with the Youth Service, Manx Sport and Recreation, CAMS and other agencies enables schools to gauge levels of emotional well-being in individuals, groups or whole school populations. Finally, secondary schools have undertaken a pupil well-being survey this year in partnership with the Child Outcomes Research Consortium. The survey period ran from January to the end of March and consisted of a set of validated measures for assessing pupils which are mental health, well-being, emotional strengths and skills and support networks. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. And thank you, Minister. That answer was encouraging. You referred to a lot of very specific things. The problem is for most children, most students, is they hit a crisis at an unexpected point. Are schools ensuring that that simple strategy, that simple solution that's out there is readily available at all times and when the child actually needs it? Yeah. In a classroom at this moment in time, it may not be required, but when the child gets home tonight at five o'clock, they may need that clarity. Are the pathways clear and easily accessible at all times? Good. Thank you. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And obviously, Honourable Member, as, as, as a teacher in his previous life, he, he knows the challenges that come into schools on a daily basis um, with regards to external hours. Um, obviously, we work closely with the Department of Health and Social Care and um, people outside of that. And um, I think the important thing for students is that collaboration and to make sure that our students are supported when they are in our school environments. Supplementary, Ms. Farragher. Gurumayu, Rector, and, uh, and thank you to the Minister for that reply. Um, it's interesting to hear that this is viewed as a strategic priority. Um, but the answer gave lots of information about what, that was based around if and when required rather than a proactive ethos. Uh, right. <clears throat> and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of local data around the impact of mental health on the school years, but we do know that our child and adolescent mental health service is struggling with the amount of referrals we're, we're, that they're receiving. And wider data shows that on average 50% of all lifetime cases um, of mental illness begin at age 14 does the Minister agree, that, therefore, that we urgently need a consistent and department-led framework for teaching and measuring well-being, i.e., does she agree that prevention is better than cure? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. And I think all honourable members in here would agree that prevention is better than cure. Um, and it is disappointing that the CAMS waiting list is so high for, for many of our students. Um, with regards to the proactive approach, that, as I've stated, um, with regards to the working in partnership with the Child Outcomes Research Consortium, that is for secondary age students, and the report um, will be provided to the schools after the Easter break. So that's imminent, and hopefully once we've got that detail, which is the first um, detail that we will have with, from all of our schools, um, obviously we can look at that and move forward. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr <coughs> President. Um, since I see related question a couple of months ago, has DESC had the opportunity to meet with key stakeholders <coughs> to bring about any improvements in this area? And it's a very fast-moving area and it's getting extra funding and extra knowledge all the time. Um, but the key bit is the individual student and ideally every student will have either their own individual programme or at least access to the support mechanisms that are in place. The Minister spoke previously about um, the internet facilities which are good and are useful, but are those actually at the top of the list? Are they in the um, students' planners? Are they available when the student actually needs it at five o'clock this evening or two o'clock tomorrow morning? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, obviously, I gave a list of, of some of the programmes that were available. There was Couth and um, obviously Jigsaw and, and names like that. Um, I think what the members alluded to is whether they're available online outside of the school day. Um, certainly, I don't think they are at this present time. Whether that is a possibility, I'll certainly look at that. Which one? Supplementary, Ms. Farragher. I just want to thank the Minister for the additional information around measuring wellbeing in secondary schools. Um, but could I ask the Minister um, if she will commit then to a consistent and department-led framework for teaching and measuring wellbeing as a priority in this administration? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, and clearly, obviously, we've done this at secondary level. At initially, um, whether there is a programme that's suitable for our primary students, um, it's certainly something to look at. Um, the difference in our primary schools, that the actual nurturing element is they have their teacher all year round, so that teacher is very well attuned to the individual needs of, in of the students. Um, but certainly, um, once we've got the outcome of this, we will be looking at it as a programme to go forward. Mm. Final supplementary, Mrs Court. <coughs> Thank you, Mr President. Um, would the Minister accept that um, any wellbeing programme offered in schools needs to be properly evaluated to ensure that providers' credentials and course content are appropriate? Is there any quality control carried out by her department when independent or third sector organisations are providing support in schools? Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And yes, we do have a number of third sector organisations and it's certainly key for, for myself and department members to ensure that the quality of what they're delivering is what's required. And we've certainly looked at there are a number of these contracts due for renewal at the present time and that is certainly one of the key priorities to make sure it's delivering what's required in our schools. Moving on to question eight, I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Custom Malou, Mr Glover. I'd like to ask the Minister for Enterprise what progress has been made with the airport technology gateway and when work will start. Minister for Enterprise to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. The Department for Enterprise is developing an airport technology gateway that can support the future economic needs of our economy. A number of businesses have shown interest in sites in the gateway and this should ultimately lead to more jobs based in the south of the island. Mm. However, these businesses have their own individual requirements, which means we must remain flexible in order to deliver what they need to succeed. I last, I last updated the Honourable Member in the other place five months ago in November last year. At the time, I stated that we were looking at July 2022 start date for initial works to commence. Global challenges around inflation and supply chains have delayed the process due to increased construction costs across all capital projects. In addition, the private sector interest has meant we need to develop the framework in line with their requirements. The Department believes it is right to hold back temporarily on the final details of the scheme to ensure that the designs maximise the opportunities for inward investment and to maximise the potential for the sites. But I am pleased to confirm the Department is working closely with the Department for Infrastructure Project Management Unit to now commence the initial stages of the ATG project plan. Planning approval has been obtained for the implementation and construction stage of the enabling scheme, and these are now proceeding to tender and procurement. This will involve hard landscaping, which includes roads, footpaths, drainage, and the provision of services to enable the, the development of the sites. We estimate that the first stage groundbreaking will be able to commence in late July, and I look forward to working with the business sector, local community, and their elected representatives to, in, to achieve the desired outcome of creating a key gateway to our island. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Glover. I did indeed ask on the uh, 9th of November in another place uh, about the airport technology gateway, which uh, the Minister said uh, there was and recognised the need for a first-class technology and high-tech business park. Uh, especially with the development of the medicinal cannabis sector, having a landing pad for those tech-focused businesses uh, will support the island's diversifying economy. And this is also continuing interest in the site for inward business investors, which means that there is a catalyst to develop the project and support those sectors for the Manx economy. Uh, can I ask the Minister if the work is suddenly now in its... We're just talking about enabling work has suddenly uh, had an injection of uh, urgency 
following two senior prominent business figures being prepared to walk away from the project. It does appear uh, to be a case of, uh, with the airport technology gateway, of freedom to flounder rather than flourish. Minister to reply. Thank you, um, Mr President. The plans for the airport technology gateway are ongoing. The um, investment has been made in terms of a master plan and the enabling work will start. And once that starts, we can then re-engage with those people who have been quite realistically frustrated by the lack of um, movement since this project began in 2016. I hope that once they can start seeing development, the enabling works, the sites being prepared for um, the, the eventual outcomes, which is inward investment, they will regain that trust that we are moving forward with this project. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Um, you've been able to speak quite confident about the enabling work. Is the funding for that enabling work currently in place? We were previously told that that would require Treasury funds. Has the CEO, has the Minister had direct involvement with that? Has the money been provided <coughs> to ensure that the enabling work the standard required will be carried out? And in terms <coughs> of the timetable, we had a date previously, but that kind of got slightly lost in the previous answer. Is there a date when we'll actually see spades in the ground? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. As I've just said, um, the, the intention is to start breaking ground in July this year. Um, and in terms of the budget, a budget has been, been agreed which will um, be able to cope with this enabling work. Money has already been spent in terms of the master planning of a lot, a lot of the surveys, and we can now go ahead with actually starting to improve the sites. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Glover. Uh, will the Minister confirm that uh, he and uh, his executives will use their very best endeavours and provide all necessary resources to ensure that the full airport technology gateway strategy is fully approved through all government processes by the end of 2023? We don't need more strategy rewrites. We've had tens of them already. It's time to get on. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I completely agree with the Honourable Member that it's time to get on. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. In terms of the money for the enabling work, is that the money that was provided in the 2019 budget, or has additional money been provided? And with regard to it being a key strategic project, is this something that the Minister has backed, is continuing to back and take forward, not only for the department, but also for the nation and the government as a whole? Thank you very much. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. The original budget was for the master planning, the surveys and the enabling work. Um, and to answer the um, Honourable Member's question, yes, I continue to back this project. It is extremely important both for the local economy in the south of the island but also for our national economy. Thank you. Now we move on to question nine. I call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Enterprise what assessment has been made by A, his department, and B, the visit agency, of both the heritage value and the tourism value of the horse tramway? Minister for Enterprise to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Over the last three years, the visit agency has commissioned a number of particular studies and more general research into visitor attractions on the Isle of Man, although none has solely covered the horse tramways. The research commissioned by the visit agency does confirm that the Isle of Man has a strong heritage and culture visitor offering, which over time has attracted and retained a loyal visitor base. These visitors, together with those visiting friends and relatives, make up the majority of the island's annual overall visitor numbers, which, in recent years, was seeing small levels of growth pre the pandemic. In 2019, some 320,000 visitors came to our island, and it has been estimated that they spent over £140 million in our economy. At the May sitting of Timwald, we will debate the new visitor strategy, which outlines the strategic plan for growing the island's visitor economy over the next 10 years, including a programme of visitor product development covering Manx heritage and culture. <coughs> our heritage transport is undeniably an important part of our, of our overall offering, but it may be difficult for anyone to put an accurate assessment on its value in isolation. Thank you. So, promotion, Mrs Cain. Thank you, Mr President. Thank the Minister for his reply, but I would question if the research has been ongoing for the past three years. I don't believe the horse tram has been operating for much of that. Um, and in terms of the 
um, extension from, from Minister Crookhall's responses earlier, it would seem that the section of horse tramway at risk is between the War Memorial and the end of Loch Promenade. Would the Minister accept that the, there is a large concentration of hotels along that section and that historically a large proportion of uh, travellers on the Manx Electric Railway have been delivered to Strathallan by the horse tramway operating along the full length of the promenade? Minister to reply. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. President. I mean, the original question was in terms of the heritage value and the tourism value of the horse tramway. And I've tried to, to point out that this is very hard to quantify. The horse tramway is an imp incredibly important part of our transport infrastructure and our heritage offering, both to visitors and residents alike. In terms of the Honourable Member's particular, specific questions, um, in terms of, of, of gauging the value of that, um, it's incredibly difficult. And similarly, it's very difficult to say whether only one particular stretch of the track is more important than the other. I think we need to look at it as a whole, um, which is, as the um, Minister for Infrastructure has said, the heritage um, railways of the island, which includes the horse trams, are an important part of, the, of our um, visitor offering and also our offering to residents. And that is being expedited by his department to try to reach a, a prompt conclusion. Thank you. Supplementary Lord, sorry, sir. Uh, is the Minister aware that in 2013 the value of the heritage railways for the island was estimated to be £11 million? Does the Minister stand by that figure and suggest that it would be at least that, if not more, for the heritage railways as, as a group in terms of its contribution to national income? Minister to reply. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mr. President. Um, in, in terms of the um, value of the Heritage Railway, the, the last decent assessment I could find of that was um, in June 2011, and when the economic <coughs> impact of the Heritage Railways was assessed by a consultancy called Ecaris, um, which actually looked at the, the overall value of the um, heritage railways, but didn't at the time look at the horse trams, because at the time that was operated by Douglas Borough Corporation. They estimated that um, it was around about 10% of total tourism expenditure was on the heritage railways, which at the time um, amounted to a direct income contribution of around about £9 million in respect to GDP. Um, I've got no reason to doubt that that will continue to grow as our visitor numbers grow, and so that, that um, co total contribution to GDP should increase year on year. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. Would the Minister agree with me that as the single remaining uh, Victorian public service horse tram uh, operation um, running it, when it re returns on its original tramway route. The Douglas Bay horse tramway is unique in the world and there must be a value in terms of retaining that for the island and for future visitors. Um, but also there, there is seemingly a value if uh, at the Antiques Roadshow is moved to come to the Isle of Man and the horse trams are operating on the small section between Strathallan and the stables. Obviously, that's going to be of value to the Isle of Man in promoting the island as a visitor destination. So, would the minister himself feel that there is a value in retaining and operating the Douglas horse trams? Minister to reply. Um, I, I'm quite happy to agree with the Honourable Member that the horse trams are invaluable. Um, without wanting to quote Oscar Wilde, the cost of them um, against the long-term value of, of, of the, both in terms of the heritage, their, their ability to attract visitors, and also to amuse residents here is invaluable. And it's extremely difficult to quantify that on any level, um, particularly as it's part of an overall heritage offering which is being promoted by um, Visit, Visit Isle of Man in terms of our tourism strategy. Thank you. We move on to question 10. I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr President. I beg to ask the Minister for Enterprise whether, in principle, he will be prepared to disclose the amounts paid to each recipient of payments under the Financial Assistance Scheme for the period 1st of April 2020 to 31st of March 2021. Minister for Enterprise to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The Department lists the names of those businesses which have received financial assistance from the Financial Assistance Scheme within the Enterprise Act 2008 Annual Report, which is laid annually before Timwald. It is a requirement of the Enterprise Act 2008 itself. However, 
In the report, the Department does not publish individual amounts associated with those businesses for competition, commercial sensitivity and confidentiality reasons. The Department analyses each application based on its merits and economic impact, and the general position is that the exchequer benefit received through the investment and jobs created is greater than the annual level of support provided. The exchequer benefit is demonstrated within the annual report. Whilst the Department is committed to transparency, there does need to be a balance in achieving this. Whilst not operating in a manner which could be determined to, to existing, detrimental sorry, to existing or relocating businesses wishing to invest in our islands and economy, our broader scheme provides flexibility to maximise economic returns on a case-by-case -case basis, and therefore it would be inappropriate for me to take a general position on the disclosure of what may be detrimental to the commercial sensitive information or detrimental to the Department's role <coughs> in helping businesses relocate or grow here. The Department has, of course, committed to publish, publish details of all support provided in response to its COVID schemes, which were typically applied on a published set of terms. Thank you. <coughs> Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and to the Minister for that um, answer. Does the Minister agree with me, then, that it might be helpful when... Uh, government is giving its message about transparency, that uh, the message becomes it's committed to transparency, although there are caveats when the information is deemed to be either commercially sensitive or detrimental to the company or the Isle of Man or advantageous to our competitors or fall under an exemption of freedom of information. And my second question is, does the Minister believe that this information would be made public if an FOI was submitted? And does the Minister not agree with me that that would be a good judge about whether or not this information should be public, given it has been made public for the COVID scheme recipients? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. <coughs> um, in terms of transparency, as I've said, that balance has to be found. In terms of the um, freedom of information, um, the, the right to obtain access to information under this um, Act um, can only be restricted if it's necessary due um, to maintain the balance with rights of privacy, effective government and value to the taxpayer. And that, I think, is, ex is exactly what government is trying to achieve. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, many cities around the United Kingdom and many of our competitors do publish all of this information, which might well be um, based around freedom of information uh, uh, concerns. And secondly, it might be that the, um, the Isle of Man could actually gain benefit by explaining how much it gives Manx Telecom and Swage Locks and Strix and all the other people listed, because that might be good promotion of the island's uh, abilities. Does the Minister agree with me that at least this needs to be investigated, whether or not we could actually benefit from publishing how much we, uh, how, how generous we are in terms of plant and equipment and build buildings as part of our competitive pitch? Minister to reply. In terms of, of things like relocation grant, the Isle of Man may be in direct competition with such jurisdictions, including Wales, Northern Ireland and, and Britain. Releasing the details of such financial support on a routine basis could, not be, could be against our national interest and may damage our ability to grow our economy and secure well-paid jobs for our people. Thank you. Lord, it's supplementary. I'm just wondering um, how the Minister has come to that conclusion. Um, I think it's a quote from Yes Minister that the, the articles of civil service faith it takes longer to do things quickly it's more expensive to do it cheaply and it's more democratic to do them in secret so I'm just wondering how has he actually tested that theory as opposed to just uh, assumed it Minister to reply Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, in terms of testing the theory, the, the only way of doing that would be to go out for, to all the recipients under the financial assistance scheme and ask them mm. um, if um, putting their details into the public domain would hinder or, in fact, advance their business cases. Um, I'm quite happy to take part, you know, to, to engage in that process with the recipients of the scheme as is currently raised. Um, the um, hon Honourable Speaker obviously w was part of the Public Accounts Committee who looked into some of the reporting under the fin Financial Assistance Scheme um, when they looked at the Media de de Development Fund and some of their um, contributions at, at, the, at the time were, were towards greater transparency in terms of the outcomes of the scheme rather than the actual physical details of the scheme itself. Thank you. 
Final supplementary, Mr Thomas. <coughs> Thank you, Mr President. Uh, would the Minister undertake to ask his officers to do a survey of um, competitor jurisdictions around the British Islands particularly to actually um, <coughs> explain to members and the public which, uh, which other places actually make this sort of information public and which, which, which don't? And secondly, does the Minister agree with me that it's quite likely that... Um, those firms who are listed in section 4.4 of our report are quite likely to be telling our competitors how much we get in the Isle of Man and if you give us a bit more we'll come to you instead so it's quite likely that this information is already out there with our competitors and thirdly does the minister not agree with me that there's the perception risk here because we have 40 business people who very generously come along to serve on the agencies and quite a few of them actually are beneficiaries of their employing bodies under the financial assistance scheme and we do have a perception issue here that we're giving out all the information for COVID recipients, smaller people but we're not for these bigger firms and that is a perception issue that we certainly need to address now it's, uh, now it's been raised by the department's decision in respect of COVID schemes. Minister to reply. Um, thank you Mr President. Um, I think there were three questions there. Um, looking at other jurisdictions, well, we, we, we do that on, on a regular basis to see how their financial assistance schemes um, compare with ours. Um, in terms of whether all this information is freely available um, because people talk about it, I don't see any particular evidence of that. And in terms of his um, final point in, in terms of perception, I'd like to point out to him that everyone all the business people who sit on, on any of our agencies um, are very aware of conflicts of interests and actually declare those at the start of any particular meeting, particularly when financial terms are involved. Thank you. Move on to question 11 and a call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castletamalu, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. <coughs> I'd like to ask the Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture how many trees in Ireland have been identified by the Department as disease? <laughs> Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Unfortunately, our island trees are susceptible to many tree diseases, some of which have been with us for many years, such as Dutch elm disease, red band needle, blight, and fire blight, to name but a few. Many of these existing diseases go relatively unnoticed, and although unwelcome, only have a minimal impact. In the last decade, my department has identified two new tree disease infections that will have a major impact on our island, with the potential to cause significant detrimental impact to our landscape and biodiversity values. Namely, Phytophthora remorum, affecting amongst many varied plants, rhododendrons and large numbers of large trees, and most recently ash dieback, affecting our native ash population. Phytophthora is Greek for plant destroyer and is a fungal-like organism causing the death of a wide range of trees and shrubs, a disease which doesn't just affect larch. Indeed, it currently has a current plant host list in excess of 150 species. Ash dieback is a fungus which originated in Asia and its arrival to Europe about 30 years ago has devastated the European ash. The nature of these infections, their life cycles and the manner of dispersal makes it impossible to eradicate and very difficult and costly to effectively control the spread of these diseases. We know that both these recent diseases have significantly affected hundreds if not thousands of trees across the whole island. My department does not record the number of trees due to the large numbers potentially infected and the significant resources that would be required to do so. Instead, work is focused on providing information, guidance and advice on general plant health, managing tree risk and monitoring for new pests and diseases as part of a wider UK and Ireland cooperation, as well as, of course, ensuring our estate remains safe for its visitors. We work also with the Department of Infrastructure on tree safety for our road infrastructure. One key aspect in relation to ash dieback is to identify trees which are showing resistance to the disease, especially if they are in close proximity to known infected trees. Such trees may have a natural genetic resistance which can help with the future recovery planning of the ash tree in our natural landscape. The information we do have with regards to the number of trees infected with the disease is with regards to elm trees felled across the island by my department. Since its discovery in 1992, 3,172 elm trees that have been felled due to Dutch elm disease. Of these, 2,155 were confirmed as disease infected the remainder being insect brood trees, where disease is not present, but populations of the disease distribution beetle have been found. It is now also estimated that all larch on the forest estate will need to be felled as a result of Phytophthora remorum disease. That equates to around 500 hectares, or 20% of our commercial forest estate. 
My department continues to prioritise the controlled felling of these areas as part of its annual forest management operation and will replant with a suitable tree species. My department maintains a close working relationship with relevant plant health organisations across the UK, Ireland and Crown dependencies, sharing information and understanding the current threats and latest developments. We also undertake regular annual surveying for the occurrences of many pests and diseases that impact not only our trees, but other flora, including agricultural crops. From this information, we know our island shares similar threats from plant pests and diseases as those experienced by the UK and parts of Europe. It is difficult to place a figure on how many there are, but a combination of significant pest and disease outbreaks and the impacts of climate change could have a drastic and dramatic landscape changing effect on our island and its biodiversity values. It's estimated that the impact from ash dieback alone could result in the loss of around 80 to 95% of our ash trees. The predicted cost of managing such diseases is exceptionally high. It includes the practical expense of managing the risk from infected, dead and dying trees to the loss of its environmental services. My department will continue to monitor disease, involvement, movement and impact. However, there are a couple of key messages that could be taken home by everyone today. The need to practice good biosecurity when visiting the countryside by cleaning boots and wheels after your visit. Purchasing plants and trees from knowledgeable, reputable nurseries who can provide you with plant traceability from seed source, and reporting any tree health concerns through the industry's Tree Alert app, which you can find online or happily contact our department. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister, for a detailed answer, especially <coughs> to recommendations at the end. All the diseases ranked in any order or all the real seen as equally bad. And is a public record available of where the diseased trees are located? Have the diseased trees close to roads and homes to be removed within a certain period of time? And does the department collect data on the number of trees identified as disease that fall before action is taken? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the main notable diseases currently of significance are Phytophthora remorum, ash dieback, Dutch elm disease, Xylella fastidosa, um, as well as Phytophthora pluvialis. Um, there aren't records that are kept or publicised of the locations, and the effort and resources required would be significant for this. For example, if we take just ash dieback, um, its significance affects thousands of trees across the island. Producing an accurate record could also mean having each tree tested to ensure it has ash dieback and not something else similar, such as common dieback, which ash can also suffer with. I think hopefully members will appreciate this is an extensive issue that my forestry team are working really hard on, but ultimately uh, we are not immune to the impacts of pests and diseases <coughs> within our tree uh, estate. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister, for that update. Um, in terms of resources available to your department, it's a small department, it's a huge responsibility. Um, are you getting sufficient funding? You're bound to say no, but <laughs> <laughs> presumably there are reasons for that. And is the department actually proactive or reactive? Are they actually going out and covering the island or responding to calls of concern? And when a tree is identified as being at risk, is any assessment carried out in terms of the risk that could potentially be done? And in terms of trees, are they all treated equally? <coughs> are all trees in the centre of a field and at the edge of a road quite different? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you. I love lots of questions together. <laughs> Our response is proactive in the early phase of a new disease, which will be based on professional and scientific advice given by the UK plant health authorities. This will be to start to learn and understand if the island has the disease, how it's transmitted and potential impact, and whether control measures will be required, and if they are, if they're likely to be effective. For example, a new disease identified in the UK during the summer of last year, which we're currently surveying for, is Phytophthora pluvialis, which predominantly affects Douglas fir and western hemlock. Fortunately, we haven't identified this on the island yet, but the officers are working through the tree population. Once a, tree is once a disease is identified, it depends on its characteristics as, as to how any controls can be implemented, if any. Every disease is different, so some can be controlled with a degree of effort, whereas others, like ash dieback, it's practically impossible. 
it's the responsibility of the tree or landowner to undertake any tree risk assessments and then, if required, manage the removal of the tree. When undertaking tree risk inspections, whether diseased or not, the tree's location should and would be taken into consideration. This can have a bearing on the final risk evaluation and any prescription for required tree work, such as tree removal. In its simplest form, a tree in the middle of a field has a lower risk rating than compared to one adjacent to a major highway, for example, where we would work with our colleagues in DOI. Therefore, even if it's diseased and dying, it may not require any work. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. Is financial support available for landowners who have issues with tree disease? And in terms of if there isn't one available, should it be available to actually encourage the, the removal, but also the planting of new trees? Because in terms of our commitment to the environment, if we've got so many trees at risk, we sure should be pushing to get more trees planted to make up for this shortfall. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you. So the Department does have a small budget to assist with management of Dutch elm disease, as well as a small budget supporting tree safety works, which does include ash dieback across the estate. It doesn't have any specific budget for control of pests and diseases on its estate or the wider landscape, and it doesn't have the resources to record and monitor large-scale infections. So any additional funding support to private landowners would need careful consideration on how it could be implemented, monitored um, and approved. I think it's, it's safe to say that this is something like trying to hold back the tide in terms of some of these tree diseases. Um, but certainly my officers are happy to talk to any private individuals um, and equally if, if trees are removed as a result of an application um, through the, the tree felling scheme, through planning, there are requirements put to replant and that would be taking into account the, the right species to go in um, in those circumstances. And certainly within our forest areas, we are ensuring that tree planting and you know, replanting is occurring when we're felling trees. Thank you, Mr. President. Final supplementary, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, clearly, these diseases are, are causing um, a lot of felling of, of hard and softwood species. Um, does that limit what the, the timber can be used? Obviously, we're looking at a lot of the timber potentially produced from all of this. Is that something that can be used, for example, in the construction industry? Or do these diseases mean that uh, the, the timber can't be used in, in certain circumstances? Because it obviously is a tremendous resource still, potentially, and we want to make sure that we, uh, we make the most of it if we can. Minister to reply. <clears throat> So I'm aware that the, all the larch that's felled within the estate can currently be used, um, as well as those from ash dieback also being used. Um, obviously, those that are felled on private land is the choice of the landowner what they would um, use that for. Um, but I'd also say we did have a, a really interesting conversation with Manx Wildlife Trust only yesterday where we talked about options such as biochar, which is something that I certainly want the department to look further into so that I can understand a little bit better about the other options that may be available to us to ensure that we're not simply... Uh, you know, not using a resource at a time when perhaps it's, uh, it's got some value to us. We move on to question 12, and I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Warrenberg. <coughs> Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Chair of the Housing and Communities Board what his assessment is of the first-time buyer schemes and what plans are being made to update them. <coughs> Thank you. Chair to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Member for the question. I understand first-time buyer schemes have assisted around 1,600 people in the last 20 years, but an important work stream is Homes for All, which is aimed to enable all island residents to own or rent a suitable and affordable home which is appropriate to their needs, and that will require an assessment. Outputs of this, workshop, of this work stream sorry, are wider access shared equity with more appropriate thresholds and other terms in the current schemes alongside further development of, for instance, rent to buy, mid-rent and key worker housing opportunities. The Housing and Communities Board has received periodic out updates from Department of Infrastructure officers about their plans and activity to review and update the current shared equity schemes. Indeed, one such update was included as the first appendix in the Housing and Communities Board Action Plan 22-23, which is currently on the Tinwald Register of Business for consideration in May. Beyond this, I can confirm that Department of Infrastructure officers made an operational policy change in December 2021 to allow some second-time buyer participation in the current scheme and have engaged actively with Attorney General's chambers about shared equity reform. It is now planned to amend the current schemes by July 2022 and to report on the more fundamental review by the end of this year. Other activity the Board currently plans in this work stream include 
publishing enhanced housing market review, including affordable housing definition by September 22, review of land registry fees to encourage local owner occupation by January 2023, continuing the policy development for mid-rent, rent to buy and public sector housing, including tenancies, rent setting, allocation management by March 2023. Further developing key worker housing policy, including working with Manx Development Corporation, the Department of Education, Sport and Culture, and the Department of Health and Social Care by March 2023, and engaging with the Bankers Association and others to enhance lending and saving arrangements by March 2023. Additional work has been identified to look at how we can objectively assess the level of housing need on the island, and I would like to see this happen in parallel to the schedule of updates to the current scheme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. President. Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the Chair consider his Housing Board to be adequately resourced, both in people and finance, to take this forward? Thank you. Chair, to reply. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, the, at the budget, a, a fund was established, was announced by Treasury, and subsequently uh, Treasury has established the terms of reference for that fund, and now departments through the Housing and Communities Board can actually make applications to Treasury for that fund. We hope, um, with the help of Cabinet Office, to make our first application to the Treasury for a member of staff in coming days or weeks, so we then should have a, a member of staff working on the uh, Housing and Communities Project. And uh, in terms of the, uh, and that will be come from the fund, and thereafter departments like the Department of Infrastructure or DHSE or Cabinet Office or somebody else can actually make uh, applications to that fund for Treasury to decide or Council Ministers to decide if it's a large amount of money, whether or not money can be spent. So to answer the question, at the moment we don't have any resources, any staff, but we do have now have access to them. And uh, I hope... Um, I'm optimistic, and I think the board is optimistic, that we can continue to do what we've done already, which is optimise provision around uh, government and, and beyond that uh, to, to, to fix this serious uh, housing issue. Supplementary, Mr Glover. Very well, Director. Um, uh, the chair of the Housing and Community <coughs> Board gave a, a figure of those that have been helped uh, within the 20 years by the first-time buyer schemes. Will he confirm that a large weight and proportion of those that have been helped in the 20 years will be towards the 10, 20 years ago and has declined quite dramatically in recent times. Thank you. No, that's, you reply? Uh, that's, uh, that's very much the, uh, the case. And the, uh, um, so in the first 10 years of the scheme, the vast majority of those would have been helped. And, that, and since 2017, the, the number helped has been 30 or 40 a year, which would never, would, wouldn't get you to 1,600 uh, if, if, um, if um, multiplied by the number of the, 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 by the 20 years. To, um, and can we do more? Of course we can. The first thing is now members might have missed that we've just brought forward the date when we can expect a shared equity scheme amended from December 2022 to July 2022. And with a fair wind and excellent work of the AG's chamber, I do hope that we'll have this on the Timwald Register so that we can be um, bringing um, the shared equity schemes up to date um, uh, in July, Timwald, for coming into force in, in August. Do we need more money for shared equity? Uh, probably not, because there is a housing reserve fund which has got five million plus pounds in it, and uh, the way that scheme works at the moment is government makes money from this scheme rather than all the money being going to help people and that 's one of the things that we 'll be with, 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 um, reviewing in um, in July when we approve the uh, amendments and then we begin work on additional schemes. And one thing I would like to say to this Honourable Court and the wider public is I'm a big fan, and I think some officers are in particular, of the mid-rent pilot scheme, which by chance I launched back in 2015 and um, was then taken forward by housing people in 2016-17. And essentially we have five houses in Colby that enable people to pay less than the market rent and save for a deposit, but we only have five houses in Colby in that scheme. And what we need to think about is massively increasing that scheme, which requires a legal basis, which is one reason why we have a law scheduled for next year to provide the legal basis for that scheme, and it will also re require this court 
initially through Treasury to get behind an expansion of the mid-rent scheme and that's where I would like to, uh, to prioritise our activities because that can make a major impact to dealing with the housing crisis. Social housing can be important as well. Improving the rented market will be important but, and that's why we're doing this fundamental review to report back to this uh, to government, through government, to this court, um, reporting, aiming to have the report completed by the end of this year. We move on to Mr. Wannenberg. Did you have a final supplementary? No, Mr. President. No. Thank you. And we move on to uh, question 13. I call on the <laughs> Honourable Member for Arbury, Castletown, Malou, Mr. Morehouse. I'd like to ask the Chairman of the Manchester Utilities Authority whether key meter customers had to pay more for electricity from the 1st of April 2022 with immediate effect, whether other customers will continue to pay the old tariff for many weeks, and what plans the Authority has to rectify the situation when the second tariff increase is applied in July. Thank you. Call on the Chair of the Manchester Utilities Authority to reply. And thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Honourable Member for his question this morning. I can confirm that Manx Utilities applied a tariff increase for electricity supplied with effect from 1 April 2022. Unlike other electricity and utility providers, Manx Utilities does not apply a tariff increase until after a metre has next been read following the introduction of a tariff change so as to ensure the tariff change is not applied to electricity consumed when the previous tariff was still in effect. Manx Utilities offers a number of different tariffs and op operates a number of different metre types. The differences in metre um, operation and differences in metering infrastructure mean that the timing of when a tariff change is applied for a customer depends on the tariff and the metre type and in the case of manually read meters, when the meter is actually read. Key meter customers, also referred to as pre-payment customers, will generally have a tariff increase applied to their electricity consumption compared to the domestic um, credit meter customer. Many, not all, pre-payment customers will have had the increase applied from the 1st of April 2022. I can confirm that there are no changes in the approach being proposed for the further increase from the 1st of July. However, we are in a position, but when we are in a position to lower tariffs, prepayment customers will be the first to benefit. Differences in timing arise from the, different, and the differences in metering infrastructure and how billing processes worked from different meters and different tariffs. It's simply just not possible to implement a tariff increase across all customers in an identical manner with the current metering infrastructure. Generally, this has led only to a small differences in costs for customers, but it is accepted that the differences for the current increases will be larger due to the larger increases being applied at the moment. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Chairman. There's a fundamental issue here in terms of when there's most pressure on because of inflation and other, other issues out there, the poorest in our society are going to pay most first of all. In terms of the MUA having this awareness, is it actually considered a special social tariff for people using key meters so they could actually pay in the first amount but the payment would be more reasonable and justifiable. Only last week the Chairman, CEO of Scottish Power suggested key meter customers should receive a discount because they are least capable of paying the increase in electricity prices. Thank you, Mr President. To reply? Thank you, Mr President. I thank the member for his question and I also thank him for making me aware of the CEO's comments where he's asked um, where he suggested that key meter customers should receive a discount. I think it's worth putting on record, Mr President, that key meter customers or prepaid customers on the Isle of Man pay no different than a domestic customer. And in the UK you will pay a considerable amount more for um, being a key meter or a prepaid meter. I think the member's absolutely right. We do need to look at these, but there's actually um, we are um, a utility company and we don't hold the data such as Treasury might hold with regard to who is vulnerable and who is not vulnerable as a customer. And some people actually use our key meters as out of choice, 
not because they're ne necessarily vulnerable. So I, I take the comments on, on board from the member, but I think a further work needs to be established to actually how many of our key customers are actually considered vulnerable, because I know from my own constituents there's many within um, general domestic customers who are also feeling this pinch from these increases. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The, the, um, when Treasury or Council of Ministers or Manx Utilities Authority, whoever it was, decided to delay part of the increase to July, firstly, and secondly then to start the new rate whenever your bill was sent, at that point, whoever made that decision made the decision that, the, that some of the poorest people who are on prepaid meters would be treated worse than richer people. And that's not the first example. For instance, if you have a, a comfy heat and um, um, an electric vehicle, you also get um, um, a cheaper electricity rate in certain hour, hours. And there are not a lot of poor people who have ground source heat pumps and electric vehicles as yet. So is this becoming systematic? Is the uh, Manx Utilities Authority not doing its, uh, its bit for poorer people? Um, is it in, in actual fact, is it doing its bit more for richer people who consume electricity in larger amounts? To reply? Thank you, Mr. President. I, I don't agree with the Honourable Member's comments. I think we've done everything we can as a, a utility company to shield our customers over the last 12 months. Uh, this, in this place and in the other place, I've repeatedly said that we've done everything we can to shield our customers to the value of around £16 million. I think it's worth um, putting on the record that Manx Utility has around 48,000 customers. Uh, under the current system, as I've said in my original answer, it's almost impossible to apply the increase to everybody on the same day. And where we've actually started, and it's worth mentioning that we are rolling out our smart meters, which will actually help people to manage their consumption as well. And I've also mentioned that our customer service team there, if anybody is struggling with their electricity bills at the moment. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. Um, does the Chair agree with me that key meter customers paid the new rate from the 1st of April, but if you were quarterly billing customer, your meter was read on the 21st of April? They were billed at the old rate up until the 21st. Does the Chair not agree with me that the key meter customers have been disadvantaged here? And is the MUA going to rectify this problem? Thank you. Chair to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. President, sorry. Um, I don't think they've been disadvantaged because, as I said, we've got 48,000 customers. Some of our business customers would have had the, apply, um, the cost, the increase applied from the 1st of April. Some of our domestic customers would have had the, the new tariff applied at, on the 1st of April. And the member's shaking her head. Why does she come and speak to me? I'll actually give her the evidence to show her. Our billing cycle goes over a two-month, three-month um, period. So some customers would have been um, had the increases applied from the 1st of April. Some of our pre-payment um, meters um, customers wouldn't have had the increase applied because they wouldn't have topped up their card yet. So I'm happy to speak to um, the, the member directly and actually to give the information to show how our billing system works. But as I've mentioned, we have 48,000 customers. It's not practically possible to bill everybody on the 1st of April. Some has to be billed first. Some gets billed over a period of time. Happy to speak to the members. You've got any further questions? <clears throat> Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, when did the MUA actually have an assessment of the people using key meters? Um, they clearly are very distinct group in terms of perhaps it's down to income, perhaps it's down to personal choice, but a distinct group and it looks questionable from the outside for the MUA to make a decision that those people would pay the increased amount on the 1st of April, whereas a medium date could have gone be chosen or even the longest possible date that people paying with quarterly bills would have. Why was the 1st of April chosen as the date when key meter users would actually have that increase? when an alternative date could have been chosen. Thank you. Chair um, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I think if you go back to our pricing strategy, which was approved by Timwald in October 2018, it clearly said that to Timwald, if the prices need to increase, it's very clear and transparent. It's according to CPI uh, in September and then applied from the 1st of April. Nothing has changed. The only thing that's changing is there's the amount of increase that's being applied on this occasion. Final supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, does the Chair uh, agree with me that um, 
effectively the Manx Utilities Authority, or perhaps it was Council Ministers, or perhaps it was Treasury, hasn't actually treated all customers equally. Because if by chance, if by chance your billing date is uh, is June, you get a hell of a you get electricity at a cheaper rate for much longer than if it's uh, if it's at the first of April. And does the chair further agree with me that that's contrary to the his basic statement over and over that he wants to treat all customers equally? And it's also contrary to the Tim Wood approved pricing strategy in which it, say, it states that customers should be treated equally and fairly. Chair to reply? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. President. I think the honourable member is right on one point because our pricing principles does say simple and transparent, stable and non discriminatory. But we, as I've said, we've got 48,000 customers. We can't bill everybody at the same particular moment in time. Hopefully, when we roll out our new smart meters, that may be a, a thing in the future where everyone does get the same um, increase on the same date, on the same time. At this moment in time, it's just not possible. Thank you, Mr. President. Move on to question 14. I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr President. I beg leave to ask the Chair of the Manx Utilities Authority what changes the Authority has considered and implemented regarding electricity tariffs for domestic customers in defined welfare support categories since its pricing strategy was approved in October 2018. Chair of the Manx Utilities Authority to reply. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Member for its questions. Following the publication <coughs> of the pricing strategy, contact was made with the relevant parties of government to consider what support could be made for groups of customers to improve the affordability of electricity. These discussions did not result in any specific change to the tariffs. However, we do continue to work with our <coughs> colleagues within Treasury. Manx Utilities also continues to work with a number of third sector organisations to support customers who may be struggling to pay their electricity bills. There is no immediate plans to undertake further work in, regard, in this regard, but um, the matter remains under periodic review and will be considered again when we look at our pricing strategy update in 2023. We continue to monitor the impact of our tariffs on our customers and ongoing energy cost crisis. And we will continue to monitor customer <coughs> feedback and provide relevant support for customers to minimise their energy costs. In the meantime, Mr President, I would remind anyone who does have concerns about their electricity bill or their consumption to contact our customer service team at Manx Utilities on 687675 or email accounts at manxutilities.im. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. So does the uh, Chair just want to confirm then that in the cold hunger and homelessness action plan from the Council of Ministers, it was reported that in addition an agreed MUA principle for pricing water, sewage and electricity is that the pricing will be consistent with government's policy, charges should be set mindful of government's social, economic and environmental po policies. More specifically, the MUA has agreed to continue to work with government to consider changes to customer support and welfare support arrangements which are targeted at households in defined welfare support categories with the cost of this subsidy being recovered by raising the tariffs to all other customers, not only other residential customers, if such support is desired and necessary legal powers are in place to do so. So MUA had that as a task which it agreed with government in 2018 and hasn't as yet fulfilled that task. Chair to reply? Yep, thank you Mr President and I thank the Honourable Member for his supplementary question. I'm more than happy to take that away. If that was an action point from a previous discussion and from a previous action plan, happy to pick that up and pick that, uh, pick that up with offices as soon as possible and to report back to the court as soon as possible Mr President. Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. In the pricing strategy uh, in 20, uh, October 2018, MUA was raising some questions about being able to, um, to carry uh, this action forward in terms of social tariffs or warm home discounts or something like that. And it talked about um, if such support is desired and necessary legal powers are in place. Can the Chair advise what legal powers are deficient to allow Manx Utilities to have done this and what sort of um, support um, was the MUA wanting to be desired in, to have put down those caveats? Do you have to reply? Thank you, Mr President. As I've just mentioned, I'm more than happy to pick up that action point and to have a look at that full debate along with any questions and concerns raised. 
I mean, Manx Utilities does not hold a huge amount of data of somebody's wealth or somebody who's in trouble, other than those who actually contact the organisation, contact the authority to ask for support and help, which we'll always listen to on a case-by-case -case basis. But on a wider discussion, more than happy to pick up the points that the member has made this morning and look at those action points and the concerns. So, mention Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. <clears throat> There are clearly challenges here, but as a simple starting point, could the Chairman and the Board consider delaying the price increase for the prepaid users by a month as a sign of what can be done and helping out many of the poorest people in our society? Thank you, Mr President. Care to reply? Thank you, Mr President. As I've just mentioned, we've got no data to actually show that our pre paid um, customers or key meter customers are the most vulnerable in our society. Yes, there will be some in there, but there's absolutely some within our domestic tariffs as well who will also be feeling the pinch of the increase. If the member has got any data to show that pre-key uh, meters are actually being disadvantaged, then speak to me. But as I said, as soon as the prices come down, they will be the first to benefit from any decrease that we applied. Supplementary, Mrs Corlett. <coughs> Thank you, Mr President. Um, the Chairman has stated that um, fairness is a priority, and if one tariff is cheaper than another, then that will have to be balanced off by <coughs> paying more. Yeah, yeah. So should those customers in defined welfare support categories have that addressed through benefits rather than yeah. through lower tar tariffs in their, from their energy supplier? To reply? Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I agree with the honourable members. I think this is a piece of work that needs to be undertaken with our colleagues in Treasury. They are the ones that actually um, have the data on people who access benefits. They're the ones who have inter introduced um, the winter, the bonus, where we've introduced £16 million of shielding all of our customers to make sure we're not discriminating against anybody to help them get through the winter period. But I think there's a bigger piece of work that we need to work on, undertake with our colleagues in Treasury to make sure that we are being fair and we're actually also capturing people that are absolutely in fuel poverty at the moment. Thank you. Final supplementary, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr President. And it's a very, very helpful answer that the Chair has given today. Perhaps it would be helpful for, for, for members and the public uh, for the Chair to add to his answer today further details about the dialogue with Treasury um, in 2019, 2020 and 2021 about this very matter and to upload it to Hansard. Chair. Thank you, Mr President. And obviously, I wasn't on the board of the Manx Utilities in 2019, 20 or 21. I only joined in November 2021. Happy to pick those discussions up again, and if need be, if they're relevant to Hansard, then I'll make sure they're put on the record. But um, obviously, there's ongoing work with Treasury as we speak. Thank you. Move on to question 16. I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury, Castamalu, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to ask you. 15. 15. 15. Apologies. <laughs> Mr. 15. <laughs> Uh, apologies to 15, jumping ahead of myself. Um, so call on uh, Mr Thomas to ask question 15. Thank you, Mr President. I beg leave to ask the Chair of the Manx Utilities Authority what proportion of the authority's electricity customers are industrial electricity customers, what proportion of the electricity consumed in the island is consumed by them, what tariff they are on, and to what extent they were shielded from the impact of high gas prices on electricity tariffs in 21 22 Chair, to reply. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank the member for his question. For 2021 2022, the proportion of electricity customers considered to be industrial customers was 1%, and the proportion of electricity consumed by them was 36%, or just over one third. These customers are on a range of tariffs, including the M1, M2, M3, M4 high volume user, high volume user 2 rate and high load factor. The tariffs have a higher standing charges than our standard domestic customer tariff but lower unit rates. In addition to the high daily standing charge, individual tariffs charge additional monthly charges for maximum demand and agreed supply capacity to reflect the impact of customers' load on the le local electricity network and electricity supply. As previously advised, the tariff supplied from the 1st of April 2021 resulted in a shortfall of income to cover the increased um, wholesale energy cost of £16 million, equivalent to 28% of our annual electricity revenue. 
As I've previously advised, the figure was equivalent to the benefit of £176 per domestic customer, totalling £7.7 million and £8.4 million for non-domestic customers. Industrial customers would have equated to £5.1 million of this latter figure. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Thank you. Um, Mr President, and to the Chair for that helpful answer, um, can the Chair confirm then that the M1, M2, M3, M4 tariffs went up by the same proportion, the, you know, the 30 per cent, as the domestic a, a, a customers? And secondly, can the, uh, can the Chair confirm my quick mental arithmetic, um, which is that um, the domestic customers then were shielded to five by the, to the extent of five million pounds is what I calculated. I think the, the chair confirmed it was five point one million. Um, so therefore, that means that the average industrial domestic customer was actually shielded to the extent of ten thousand pounds, given that one percent of the forty-eight thousand customers are um, industrial domestic customers. That's sixty times better than the domestic customers. Ten thousand pounds is sixty times greater shielding than you got if you were a poor person um, on, 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 on a domestic customer. Does the Chair confirm my mathematics and does he think it's right that uh, large industrial customers were shielded by £5.1 million, which on average is £10,000 per customer approximately? Chair to reply. Thank you, Mr President. On the first part, as to the best of my knowledge, yes. Um, all customers, um, obviously, the, uh, had the, the, the increase applied to their um, tariffs from the 1st of April, which was um, agreed in line with the pricing strategy and the additional increase to take into account the pricing crisis in respect to the cost of natural gas. In respect of the percentage, I did ask this question myself yesterday. I, I think I will probably write to members because um, it's very clear to get an average for the domestic customers, but um, when we talk about non-domestic customers, it really does depend on their usage. Some of our um, biggest customers you know, pay you know, millions of pounds for electricity. So I will write to the member and I'll write to honourable members just to clarify that last point on non-domestic percentage um, payments, Mr. Speaker President. Supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. President. And so, before we get into the uh, the mathematics, does the chair, does his board, does Treasury? <coughs> As Council of Ministers, as far as you know, believe it's right that £5.1 million was shielded from the likes of the hospital and other large government users, from Tesco's, from Manx Telecom and other large data centres, when that £5.1 million could have been used to help out a little bit gas customers who were struggling, especially given the just transition. That £5.1 million could have been used to invest in improving the metre system so we didn't have to discriminate against poor, against poor people because they have to pay from 1st of April, whereas everybody else gets lower. That £5.1 million could have been used for alternative energy and at home energy efficiency planning for the future. Does the Chair think that's right, that um, somebody's decided to shield big customers by £5.1 million with no, nothing brought to Tim Wald uh, um, about that? Chair to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I think I've put on the record previously I was not on the board when this decision was taken. But I will just repeat what it actually our pricing principles actually say. They have to be simple, transparent, they have to be stable, and they non, have to be non-discriminatory. What the organisation or the, the authority decided to do was to split the, the amount of money that was going out equally between non-domestic and domestic customers, and that is what the authority has done. I don't have the percentages of what was given to non-domestic customers, but I know from a domestic customer was £176, which is, I've already gone on the record, and I think most Manx Utility customers welcomed that help over the winter period. Final supplementary, Mr Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Does the Chair agree with me that the pricing review, the Tim Wood approved pricing review, would have allowed for... Uh, price changes in the course of 2021-2022 in the event of something like the gas price uh, moving. So therefore, can the Chair advise whether or not the Board, and perhaps the Treasury and Council of Ministers if he knows, even considered this point that I have made about this huge use of public funds to, to support large industrial customers that in the pricing review it actually said MUA should start supporting less. That is actually what it states in the pricing review. They should move over to treating customers equally. Chair to reply. 
Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said, I wasn't on the board, so I, I wasn't party to the discussions that were made, but I'm happy to pick up his points. I think they were valid points. I will write to honourable members formally and give the information once I've understood the situation myself. Thank you, Mr. President. We'll now move on to question 16. I call on the honourable member for Arby Castamaloo, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure what his department's policies on prevention of parking on pavements and whether that policy changed after the announcement on the matter made by the constabulary on the 16th of March 2022. Thank you. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. The Manx Highway Code states that you must not park wholly or partly on a pavement without a police officer's permission. Parking on a pavement can obstruct and seriously inconvenience pedestrians, people in wheelchairs or with visual impairments, and people with prams or pushchairs. The Department supports the Isle of Man Constabulary in addressing pavement parking contraventions to improve the safety and amenity of pedestrians, particularly those who are vulnerable through disability. There has been no policy change in my department. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Um, is the enforcement of this law in suburban cul-de-sacs different from what happened before? You said it wasn't a new policy, but is it different? Have parking controllers ever assessed and issued tickets in areas such as Elizabeth Rise prior to the announcement on the 16th of March? Thank you. Minister to reply. Mr President, the controllers haven't assessed anything. The law is the law. They go out their job, whether it be in suburban cul-de-sacs or the towns or wherever it may be, and if people are parking on pavements, whether it be in fact the controllers or the police officers, whether it be early in the morning or late at night, if people probably are parked in dangerous or what they, call, what they would call inconsiderate places, I'm sure people, you know, that's why they give the tickets out. Yeah. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Minister. I'm not, I'm not changing the law. The law is important and we almost abide by it. But, but in terms of the change that have happened, there's been an issue in terms of rather than issuing advisory notes, rather than making people aware that this was something that was now happening, it seems to have just been taking place in suburban areas and people have been seeing a different side of DOI, a new enforcement policy. W was this something that was happening before March the 22nd? Sorry, March the 16th, 2022. Thank you. Minister, to reply. Mr President, I think for years probably the police have uh, gone out of their way to try and be nice to motorists and left them alone, if you like, and probably parking controllers to some extent. There was a warning given out on that date, the Honourable Member has said, um, and the police have followed up on it like they said they would do. You know, we, we have to abide by the law, and if people are seen to be parking in dangerous positions or on the pavement blocking it for pedestrians, then the police or the tra traffic controllers will act accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. We can move on to question 17. Calling an honourable member for Arbery, Castan and Maloo. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Morris. I'd like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure what progress has been made with proposed changes to traffic management in and around St. Mark's. Thank you. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Mr President, the Department met again with Maloo Commissioners on 2 December 2021 and it was agreed that good quality planters should be installed. At the same meeting, it was also agreed that the Department will engage with resident, residents on the most appropriate type and seek to implement their preferred option. The Department had programmed the renewal scheme for 2022-23. It was originally envisaged that resident engagement would happen in the last quarter of 21-22. However, due to COVID-related backlogs and resource issues, department, departmental priorities have had to be focused on other areas. The department plans to carry out other to carry out the resident engagement after TT this year. I mentioned Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. It's rather concerning that this decision was made many months after the last lockdown, many months after we got used to life as normal, and. We're now looking at another jump forward in time to actually talk to the residents. The residents have been spoken to about this issue since August 2020 and has been clarity in terms of what the residents want and the outcomes. Could the Minister and could the team actually review what the residents have asked for previously and speed the process up? Because at the moment we seem to be going backwards and backwards rather than going forwards. Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Mr President, following the trial, the Department wanted to improve the quality of the planters. Though this appeared to have the support of the residents, the Commissioners were not initially supportive, so no improvements were made. Supplementary, Dr Hayward. 
Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> I'd just like to ask, given the impending works on, in Santon during the winter and the fact that that route is going to be designated for <coughs> HGVs, uh, whether the Minister would consider perhaps holding off putting his nice new planters out until the big lorries have finished going past? Minister to reply. This whole issue will be looked at, Mr. President, before the work is commenced, and uh, members uh, from down the south will be uh, consulted on, on, on this. Final supplementary, Mr. Moyes. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in terms of the timetable, I'm rather concerned about how short it is. We're speaking to residents after TT, so this will be the end of June. The road closures are starting to happen from the start of September. It's a very narrow period to talk to the residents to get the alternatives in place and the real solutions. Is it realistic? Can the Minister actually achieve that in that small time frame when most of the material is already on the desk of the people who can make the decision? Thank you. Minister to reply. Mr President, I'd, I'd love to have a sit down and a chat with the Honourable Member because I don't know how big a problem this really is. He's trying, trying to make it out to be a really big problem. We're not getting this feedback from anybody else except from himself. And if there's an issue there, it's an enforcement issue with the Home Affairs, with the police. Now, the officers will go out and speak to the, mem with, to the residents after TT, but it may well be, as the Honourable Member, um, the question before has mentioned, that there is this plan works on the A5. So it may well be that actually what's, what we agree on afterwards isn't installed again until after that works. But we'll have to, and as I said, we will consult with all the members that are involved in that area. I hope he's happy with that answer. We'll move on to question 18. Call on the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr President. I beg leave to ask the Minister for Enterprise what the terms were of Freedom of Information Request Reference 2216151 received on 28th of January 2022. On what basis the response was prepared and which officers and politicians saw the response before it was issued? Call on the Minister for Enterprise to reply. Mr President, the request to which the Honourable Member refers was a request for information on financial assistance from the Department's COVID support schemes applied for and given to all MHKs who own businesses. The request itself and the answer is publicly available on the Oliman Government's website disclosure log. As with many Freedom of Information requests, however, this required clarification. The Department clarified with the requester that we would conduct our search on those who had been MHKs in either the previous or current administration, and that we would define ownership as a shareholding or directorship that had been declared on the register of members' interests in either the previous or in this administration. The response was prepared and seen by officers within the Enterprise Support Team who had administered a number of the COVID support schemes, officers in the Visit Agency who administered the Strategic Capacity Scheme and the Freedom of Information Team who were to provide the response. The response was also seen by the Director of Policy and Strategy, the Head of Marketing and Business Intelligence, the Deputy Chief Executive, Chief Executive and myself before being issued. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and to the Minister for that um, helpful answer. Um, can the uh, Minister advise why it was that the Department chose to engage with the Freedom of Information, information requester um, to extend the question? Because the question was about people current MHKs who own businesses. It wasn't about previous MHKs, it wasn't about directors of companies, it wasn't about people who were directors of charities. So why did the department choose to extend the, um, the request beyond what was originally asked? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. The department didn't extend what was originally being asked. The department clarified with the requester exactly which information he or she was interested in and replied accordingly. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Well, perhaps the, um, perhaps the requester agreed to have the uh, request extended, but why did the department, can the minister advise why the department chose to go back to former? MHKs to actually include charities because charities aren't businesses that are owned by any MHK. They're charities, and many of the people are appointed to by this honourable court um, to um, to charities. So why did the department choose to extend it in in, in, in consultation with the uh, anonymous FOI um, requester? Minister to reply. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. 
The decision to um, try to be as transparent and inclusive as possible was in accordance with the requester's wishes and the very essence of the Freedom of Information Act. I'd like to also point out that those MHKs have declared their interests on the Timbal Members, member, members Register of Interests, and so it's quite appropriate that those re registrations and those involvements were also included in the request. Thank you. Final supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Does the um, uh, Minister agree with me that it's quite unusual for the Minister to see a Freedom of Information um, response before it's issued? Uh, and and were, were any other politicians also in receipt of that information? Presumably the factual accuracy was, uh, was checked with all of the people whose information was going to be revealed. Perhaps it went to the Department for Enterprise uh, Board for their, for, their, uh, for their commission. Perhaps it went to Council of Ministers. Um, can, the, can the Minister advise a bit more about who saw this information before it was released, given particularly because it had to be uh, changed um, subsequently? And secondly, can the Minister advise that the normal procedure is that politicians, except in terms of checking their own information for its accuracy, are not normally involved in freedom of information responses. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I, I, I won't agree with the Honourable Member that the Council of Ministers would be responsible for looking at freedom of information requests. That's quite, quite absurd. Um, and the Honourable Member knows enough about the freedom of information requests and the need for confidentiality to answer his own questions. In terms of questions involving freedom of information that come into the department um, following previous experiences. Those are now logged so that um, political members and the board are aware of what questions are being asked. They are kept confidential and those reports when they are due, due to be released by the department are shared with me, both in terms of accuracy but also to ensure that I can um, ensure that the responses given by my department are as honest and transparent as possible. Thank you, Mr. President. Move on to question 19. I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. President. I beg leave to ask the Chair of the Manx Utilities Authority what the policy is regarding the forward purchasing and hedging of gas prices for Manx Utilities and Manx Gas is, and who is responsible for the implementation of this policy. Chair of the Manx Utilities Authority to reply. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question this afternoon. Manx Utilities' policy regarding forward purchase of natural gas for its own use is a hedge forwarding, is hedge forwarding over a three-year um, time horizon based on a laddered approach for each financial year. The policy is set by the Board and implemented by the Manx Utilities Energy Trading Team via the Executive. Manx Utilities also purchase natural gas for Manx <coughs> Gas on both a daily basis and a forward basis at its own request to suit its needs and requirements. Such purchases are on a pass-through ex execution basis only. Manx Utilities is not required to forward purchase natural gas on Manx Gas behalf under its um, contract agreement with Manx Gas. However, this practice has been followed for many years and is also undertaken by Manx Utilities Energy Trading Team. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you to the Chair uh, for that um, answer, um, explaining the, the way that the market is approached. Can the Chair give, further inf give, give some information about the practical arrangements uh, in, inside the hedging policy for both Manx Utilities and Manx Gas? So, for instance, uh, credit control, um, how, how often is that assessed by the energy trading team or by the board? limits, bank references, margins, mm. deposits, terms by, uh, through which pa payment is due. How is that, um, how, what is the policy regarding particularly Manx Gas in respect of uh, those things? Do you have to reply? Thank you, Mr President. Um, normally this is all undertaken annually and um, as, you, as you said, it's been very stable and very um, proactive and positive over the last 10 years, but then obviously in 2021, March, April 2021, we started to enter into a financial pricing crisis. So obviously it was absolutely right that we looked a little closer at these um, policies around hedging, especially around the financial information and the risks attached with forward purchasing because it's also, when we purchase that gas, we are also liable for it if, 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 if anyone does not pay those hedging contracts. 
Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Thank you, Mr President. So do I understand then that annually Manx Utilities um, assesses inside its hedging policy for Manx Gas, the credit of um, Manx Gas, the, uh, the lines, the requirement for deposits, and um, would he be able to make public all of the assessment of the most recent uh, pre-emergency, pre-gas price rise assessment for that, and, how, and, and also how that changed um, in recent years? Chair to reply. Thank you, Mr President. No, I did actually say that Manx Utilities looks at its own hedging policy annually, and the fact, as I've said in my original answer, we are able to buy and hedge gas for Manx Gas under their terms and conditions, and it is on their instructions that we will buy that. The only, the, the only um, um, concern we had is in October last year when they asked us to forward purchase, we asked for some financial information which they did not provide. And I would just like to put on record, at no time have Manx Utilities ever refused to actually hedge and um, buy gas on behalf of Manx Gas's um, behalf. Final supplementary, Mr Thomas. Okay, thank you, Mr President. So, uh, what, can the Chair advise when the, uh, the, the last time was that the Board actually reviewed the terms and conditions uh, for hedging, for forward purchases, for cash purchases, for gas, um, in terms of its trading relationship with Manx Gas? Was that recently? Or is it an annual occurrence? And secondly, can the, um, can the Chair advise whether the... Uh, either the energy trading team or the Manx Utilities Board actually get information systematically from Treasury or the Communications and Utilities Regulatory Authority in respect of some of the questions they might have, or is that information that Manx Gas is just giving to Treasury and to the Communications and Utilities Regulatory Authority that isn't passed on to, um, to Manx Utilities? I guess the uh, final question, if you uh, final supplementary, is that um, um, Jeff.im has been pursuing a freedom of information request which it published quite extensively um, this morning, very, very helpful freedom of information request. Can the Chair um, advise who received a copy of the letter that was sent to the Chief Executive of Manx Utilities, Phil King, that's now been uh, widely discussed? Did he receive a copy and which other politicians received a copy of that letter? Chair to reply. Mr President, unfortunately I will have to ask the Member just to go back on his first question because I didn't quite hear it. Um, on the, the last part, I mean, this, this question is around hedging, not around an FOI request. So I'm not going to answer that part of the question. Can the member just give me the first question he asked because, I, unfortunately, I didn't hear it? Mr Thomas. Please. The, uh, the, the chair very helpfully described the fact that forward purchasing, gas purchasing for Manx Gas was done under the terms and conditions that apply to that relationship, when were those terms and conditions uh, last reviewed and how often are they reviewed? Is it periodic or is it just, uh, just once in October 2021? Chair to reply. And thank you, Mr President. I'm happy to write to the member just to ask him, uh, because there is a contract in place that clearly sets out the terms of that arrangement between Manx Utilities and Manx Gas. I will just repeat that, as you say, it's up to Manx Gas to approach us to ask that they want us to, to buy um, gas on their behalf on a daily basis or on a forward purchasing contract. Our only concern is during um, October last year when the price significantly increased that we asked for some additional financial information with regards to those contracts. I'm happy to um, write to members again, Mr President, just to be very clear on the terms of that contract. Thank you.